They are cosmic killers. They're the end of stars, they're the deaths of stars. Spectacular stellar detonations. 100 billion times as bright as the sun. That for an instant outshine a whole galaxy. The most massive energetic event in the universe since the Big Bang. Out of this exceptional cosmic catastrophe comes creation. But if one struck near here, life on Earth would cease. The universe, the cosmic crime scene for a most violent and mysterious force. Supernovas. Supernovas, the sensational and exceptional death of stars, produce the biggest blasts in the universe. Now, only a small minority of stars actually explode, but those that do just go kablam, blowing themselves to smithereens. Releasing more energy than the sun does in its entire lifetime by more than a billion. The spectacular detonation blasts vast amounts of lethal radiation into the universe. If a star at the center of the planetary system would go supernova and explode, it would probably wipe out all forms of life in that planetary system. Radiation would basically sterilize all forms of life on any planet in a planetary system. Like homicide detectives poring over clues to a cosmic crime, Scientists use state-of-the-art tools, telescopes, and technology to find supernovas and to solve the mystery of how and why they occur. It's an interesting thing because the explosion, the event, has already taken place. And then we get these clues which we gather with our telescopes and try to figure out what happened. As the stellar investigators know, Supernovas have a dual personality. They have absolute power to destroy. And at the same time, they are fundamental to creation itself. When a supernova goes off, the explosion produces a lot of light, but it also produces heavy elements out of the light ones. So, for example, iron or calcium or sodium or any of the elements of the periodic table, those things came from exploding stars that went off before the sun was formed. The elements produced in these enormous stellar explosions actually make planets, plants, and people. The calcium in your bones and the oxygen that you breathe were all cooked up in stars and blown out into space. The shock waves from exploding stars can compress nearby clouds of gas and trigger their gravitational collapse so that they begin the renewed process of formation of new stars, planets, and ultimately life. Thanks to circumstantial cosmic evidence collected, experts estimate that a mighty supernova goes off somewhere in the universe once every single second. So that's something like 30 million per year, and that's been going on for the last 10 billion years or so of the universe's existence. Giving us a sense of how big the universe is, in a typical galaxy like our Milky Way, a supernova suddenly occurs only once or twice a century. However, nobody knows when the next one might come. It's a completely random process, so we have no idea when the next one will occur. It could be tomorrow, could be you know, five minutes ago, could be another 100 years. We don't know. If it is very close, you would see a very bright event in the sky. It could be even brighter than the, the Venus or the planets or even the moon or maybe even the sun if it's bright enough. If a supernova is too close to you, it can definitely destroy life. The flash disrupts the atmosphere, burns things up. 
astronomers are constantly policing the skies, keeping a wary eye on at least two stars in the Milky Way that have the potential to catastrophically explode close to Earth. One that threatens to blow lies in the heart of the Eta Carina Nebula, about 9,000 light years away. Eta Carina is one that we know about, which is a very massive star, maybe even 100 times the mass of the sun, has a very short life. And it could be that the end of that life uh, will take place sometime very soon. Another star in danger of going supernova is Betelgeuse a star in the Orion constellation. This seething star is 15 times the size of the sun. This one is even closer than Eta Carina to Earth. It's roughly 500 light years away. It'll be a spectacularly brilliant sight, visible even in the daytime. There's no question Betelgeuse is gonna blow up. It could be tonight, for all our ignorance, it could be 10,000 years from now, short on an astronomical time scale. But it could be tonight that we're, we're sufficiently ignorant about it. So it, it is worth looking at every night to see whether it's blown up. Not only do the massive supernova explosions create and destroy stars, planets, and people, they also unleash powerful energy in the form of cosmic rays. These highly energetic charged particles strike our planet each and every day. What's more, they have the capacity to alter evolution. We live in a, what I call a disturbed galactic ecology. It is a very eruptive, energetic galaxy out there, and our planet is gonna get pummeled by that stuff. Experts say they can and do change life as we know it. Well, we know that there are genetic mutations that take place when cosmic rays hit living things. It disrupts the DNA inside cells. And if there were a supernova nearby, there could be a lot more cosmic rays, like a hundred or a thousand or a million times more than we ordinarily get. If you're the old species, it might lead to your demise, but it also might lead to new species being developed. So a supernova could be an agent of change, and it could be for better or for worse. Knowing that supernovas have the power to create and alter life makes it imperative that humankind unravel the riddle of what makes these stellar time bombs tick. What have you got here? All right, so uh, this is the supernova yeah, factory, awesome. supernova. Uh... The key to unlocking the mystery lies in the detailed analysis of what is ejected into the cosmos by a supernova. I'm glad this one did not escape our attention because it was a winner. Yeah. It's a great supernova. Nature has given us this puzzle. It says, well, I make these objects easily, and we as theorists have to figure out how nature does it. As with any crime scene, critical clues are contained in what is left behind. Like a gunshot, hot gases and explosive debris are propelled through space by these deadly stellar explosions. Just as these gunshots are driving a shockwave, and you can hear this strong noise from the shockwave, it's actually compressing the matter and heating it up. Shockwave in a supernova is doing the same thing. As these pieces of shrapnel are hurtling very fast through space, they collide with the material around it, and what forms is a shockwave. The fantastic stellar detonation shoots vast amounts of ballistic supernova evidence, cosmic debris called remnants, into the universe. So the remnants are produced as the shockwave keeps on moving out through the universe. It actually produces this very picturesque image of the shock moving outward. The gases that made up that star uh, are ejected at tremendous velocities, 10,000 miles a second, and so they create an expanding shell, and eventually that can become very, very large. These things go for thousands of years, or even tens of thousands of years. So sometimes we can see the site of a supernova explosion tens of thousands of years after the event has taken place. The high-speed collision of stellar debris in the shock wave produces intense heat and light in wavelengths invisible to the human eye. 
They include radio, infrared all the way to X-rays, and gamma rays. Fortunately for astronomers, sophisticated space-based instruments like Hubble, Spitzer, and the Chandra X-ray telescope can help the cosmic detectives see them all. So basically every instrument in every way you can gives you a somewhat different perspective on what's going on. And then you try to put all that together as an intellectual enterprise. Like a fingerprint, each supernova has a unique pattern and they can be analyzed in several different ways. One thing we can do is measure how bright the supernova is, and that's what we call the light curve. The other thing that we can measure that is really helpful is what we call the spectrum. We take the light from a supernova at a telescope, spread it out into a little rainbow using a prism or a grating, and then measure how much light there is uh, at each color or wavelength. Analysis of that line can tell us lots of interesting things, like the chemical composition of the supernova, the temperature, the pressures and densities of the gases, how quickly they're expanding, and so on. Information gleaned from the light curve and spectrum reveals distinctions between each supernova. So it is much like a detective job, where you get different clues from the light curve or from the spectrum and try to figure out what kind of star it was, what made it explode, what the products of the explosion were, and what the effects of that explosion might be. As time goes on, we can see deeper and deeper into what the star originally was, so we can actually get uh, what the composition of the star was at the time it exploded. By comparing the light curves and spectra from literally hundreds of supernova cases, Scientists have been able to classify supernovas into two main types. Type 1A supernova release no hydrogen. The explosions are uniform in size and luminosity. Type 2 supernova release large amounts of hydrogen. The explosions vary greatly in size and luminosity. But why would there be such distinct types of exploding stars? Might they be blowing themselves apart in different ways? Scientists focused their efforts on uncovering the mammoth question. What drives these stellar monsters to destroy themselves? Like bounty hunters looking for bandits, Today's astronomers scour the cosmos looking for deadly supernovas. With their keen eyes on the sky, they belong to a long lineage of stellar observers. In fact, the first supernova ever witnessed by man occurred in China in 185 AD, 2,000 years ago. The Chinese astronomers kept very meticulous records about what they saw in the sky. Specifically, when something new appeared, they recorded how bright it was, where it was, how long it was there. Using the Royal Chinese records, stellar investigators today have recently found the remnant of this ancient supernova. It is identified as RCW86 and is in the constellation Centaurus near two bright stars known as Alpha and Beta Centauri. 1,400 years after the Chinese discovery, the first European observer witnessed a supernova. On November 11, 1572, 26-year-old Danish astronomer Tycho Brahe was taking a walk when he witnessed a shocking stellar phenomenon in the northern sky. It was right next to the W, etched by the brightest stars in the constellation Cassiopeia. Even though he saw it, and even though he was the leading astronomer of his age, he did not believe the sense of his own eyes. A few years after Tycho's remarkable sighting, his former pupil, Johannes Kepler, made his own groundbreaking observation of a new star. 
be measured from star to star around it, the distance. And we can use that now to recreate exactly the position of where it exploded. When contemporary investigators took a closer look at Kepler's 1604 remnant, they found something very strange about it. A detailed analysis of the chemical composition of the ejected and expanding gases indicated that there were two stars that somehow conjoined to produce a gigantic explosion. So how did this companion cause the stellar catastrophe? Many stars are in binary systems, so they have a partner that is orbiting around them. And we think what happens is that one star puts mass onto the other. Experts have since found that the companion or binary scenario is the hallmark of what is called a type 1A supernova. The type 1 supernovae, we think, are the explosion of white dwarfs. So a star like the sun will produce a little dense nugget about the size of the Earth. When a star like the sun dies, it ejects its outer layers and leaves behind just a small, dense, burnt-out core called a white dwarf. The ashes of the sun will be a carbon and oxygen white dwarf. Left by, to its own devices, that will just last forever and cool off. But when a star has a companion, like a partner in crime, it can lead to catastrophe. One star puts mass onto that white dwarf, pushes its mass up to the point where it becomes unstable, and that there is burning that takes place in the center. And very, very rapidly, the star goes from being a kind of boring white dwarf to being a tremendously violent and brilliant supernova. But why do some white dwarfs catastrophically explode? That was figured out in 1930 by a brilliant young astrophysicist, Subrahamyan Chandrasekhar, the Sherlock Holmes of astrophysics, on a boat trip from India to England. During this long voyage, he used the newly developed fields of quantum physics and special relativity to come up with the idea that a white dwarf can have only a certain maximum limiting mass. You cannot go beyond a certain mass about 40% bigger than that of our sun, 1.4 solar masses. And this came to be known as the Chandrasekhar limit. And at that point, an uncontrolled runaway chain of nuclear reactions ensues. But for decades, scientific investigators remain puzzled by just how this explosive chain reaction worked and what it looked like when it did. Computer models could never recreate what seemed to be happening in nature. But then in 2006, Astrophysicists from the University of Chicago's prestigious Flash Center literally cracked the code. The Chicago team was the first to create a supercomputer program capable of processing the vast amounts of data. It had to be to simulate the complicated dynamics involved in the explosion of a whole star. We call this extreme computing. The computers we use, some of them have 128,000 processors, so they're really 128,000 desktop computers all linked together. Even with all that power, it took almost 60,000 hours of computing time. The astrophysicists decided not to start their simulated explosion exactly at the center of the star. The reason that we decided to start slightly off center rather than right at the center is that it's just very, very improbable that the flame will ignite exactly or even really close to the center. There's just no volume there. There's no there there. According to the remarkable simulation, in one second, a flame bubble forms inside the star. So what you see right in the center of the star is the bubble rising quickly, growing, expanding as the burning takes place, and breaking through the surface of the star. The molten bubble initially measures approximately 10 miles across. 
and rises more than 1,200 miles to the surface of the star. It's spreading over the star at about 3,000 miles a second, and it collides at the opposite point on the surface of the star and produces extremely energetic jets. One that's moving outward at about 40,000 miles a second, and another jet that's punching in towards a star, and that ignites a detonation wave, which you've just seen race through the star. Torrid temperatures, depicted using a standard color scale, reach an unfathomable three billion degrees Fahrenheit. And you can see the moment is just detonated, and going through the star takes less than half a second. The whole burning phase takes less than three seconds. Expert analysis reveals that each Type 1A supernova is remarkably similar in size and brilliance. This explosion is equivalent to completely detonating a mass the size of the sun. This groundbreaking computer simulation illustrates for the first time how the explosions could occur in a Type 1A supernova. But Type 2s seem to be a radically different animal. By examining the stellar debris, scientists have reasoned that Type 2 supernovas are not the result of exploding white dwarfs, but rather the huge blasts of massive dying stars, at least 10 times the mass of the sun. But how do these mega explosions work? The answer to the cosmic conundrum would come in the middle of the 20th century. That's when supernova gumshoes, for the first time in history, pounded the intergalactic pavements, systematically seeking gigantic exploding stars. Like detectives on a stakeout, cosmic investigators constantly scan the night sky. They're looking for the telltale bright lights that are evidence of a supernova. To carry out their surveillance, they use an impressive array of high-tech telescopes scattered across the globe. Historically, we discover supernovas with ground-based telescopes, either scanning the sky constantly to look for new supernova explosions. The cosmic supernova hunt began in the 1930s. Maverick astrophysicist Fritz Zwicky led the charge. He was the first to methodically search, catalog, and quantify new and exploding stars. He was one of the real pioneers in finding exploding stars. And then he wanted to physically understand what they are. The trailblazing astrophysicist proposed that these enormous and spectacular stellar events were the result of whole stars exploding. Swicky predicted that a certain kind of exploding star can occur when a massive star's core collapses and then rebounds, creating a colossal explosion. During the collapse, they said, a compact remnant should be formed, a ball of neutrons, a neutron star. Essentially, the ordinary matter is made out of protons and neutrons and electrons. Now, in this collapse of an iron core, the, the, the protons and the electrons that make up the iron atoms combine to make neutrons. A neutron star is an incredibly dense object. Now, if you were to take a large building like the Empire State Building in New York, and compress it to the density of a neutron star, it would be about the size of a marble. They uh, have a very high density. And in fact, a teaspoon of neutron star material would weigh as much as one billion tons on Earth. Scientists today believe that only huge stars, at least 10 times the mass of the sun, have the potential to generate this core collapse type explosion. A massive star generates energy by fusing hydrogen to helium. It can fuse helium into carbon and oxygen, and it keeps on going all the way up to make iron. Iron is the most tightly bound nucleus, so when a star has made iron, it's really at the end of the line, 
and it's ready for disaster. The iron core forms in the last day of the star's life. And then it becomes so massive that essentially it collapses under its own weight. It just collapses gravitationally very quickly. It takes less than a second for the core of the star to crunch down from something about the size of the Earth to a neutron star, which is maybe 10 or 15 miles across. But this dense iron core doesn't settle down peacefully into its new life as a neutron star. But instead of reaching an equilibrium configuration right away, the neutron star rebounds off of itself, just as the gymnast rebounds off of the trampoline and goes upward again. Well, this rebounding neutron star collides with the material surrounding it and imparts some of its energy to that colliding material, thus initiating an ejection. However, unlike a gymnast for whom gravity ultimately prevails, pulling him back to Earth, in a core collapse scenario, something else continues to drive the ejection outward. The question became, what was this mysterious force driving the blast into space? Experts calculated that in order for a successful explosion to occur, one more ingredient was needed. They suspected something called neutrinos, ghostly energy-bearing particles that had been predicted but never observed. Astrophysicists believe that during a core collapse, when the electrons are pushed so close to protons in the nuclei of atoms that they combine to become neutrons, in the process, they release these tiny, mysterious neutrino particles. The neutrinos are kind of interesting particles. They don't have any electric charge, so they don't interact with light. They only interact by what physicists call the weak force. And the weak force is aptly named. It means that these particles can go right through the Earth. They can go through long chunks of matter. So they're, they're like ghosts. They just go through things. For centuries, modern astronomers had been studying the remnants of supernovas in faraway galaxies from the distant past. But in 1987, they would get a front row seat to an explosion of their very own. It was the brightest supernova seen in nearly four centuries, long after the development of the telescope. So we could use our full arsenal of equipment to study this fantastic blast. In 1987, the most fantastic stellar event near our galaxy since the invention of the telescope occurred. The first to witness it was young Chilean astronomer Oscar Dilhalde. His and astronomy's good fortune came on the night of February 23, 1987. A telescope operator at the Las Campanas Observatories, Oscar Duhalde, put water on for coffee and went outside to take a look at the sky. And when Oscar went out there, he looked at the large Magellanic Cloud, which he knows very well, and he noticed that there was an extra star. So he discovered this supernova explosion by basically running outside the telescope building and saw it with his own eyes. When a star explodes, Astrophysicists, like investigators looking for clues to a crime, know that the first few hours after the stellar death are the most critical. So in 1987, when the closest supernova in nearly 400 years appeared, they knew they had to act fast. It was only about 170,000 light years away, a mere stone's throw for an astronomer. Supernova 1987A was in a small galaxy called the Large Magellanic Cloud, a dwarf galaxy that orbits around our much bigger Milky Way galaxy. Being the first supernova of that year, 
the exceptional and nearby exploding star was simply labeled SN1987A. But this time, dozens of seasoned astronomers all over the planet were ready for action. Armed with sophisticated tools and telescopes, they turned their minds and machines to the heavens and closely scrutinized Supernova 1987A. Knowing that an exploding star is at its hottest in the first few hours and is emitting lots of light in ultraviolet wavelengths, the astral detectives sprung into action. At the time of the explosion, we saw the fastest moving stuff was coming toward us at a tenth of the speed of light. So that was the actual star blowing up. Scientists had their explosion. Now they wanted to know the name of the victim. They dug through a catalog that lists all known stars and their positions in the sky. When they struck, pay dirt they found the star that exploded. It was tagged SK69202. They also determined that it was a huge star, 20 times the mass of the sun. Examining the spectral evidence, scientists could see strong lines of hydrogen. SN1987A bore the hallmarks of a type II core collapse supernova. But to confirm their suspicions and prove the core collapse theories, experts had to have one more piece of physical evidence. They needed neutrinos, those ghostly particles that scientists predicted would be unleashed during the blast. In the early 1980s, scientists had built a handful of neutrino detectors around the world they consisted of tanks deep underground filled with tons of pure water. But these detectors had yet to capture a single supernova neutrino. We've had this story for a long time that most of the energy of a supernova explosion, a core collapse supernova explosion, goes into neutrinos. But we had never seen those neutrinos. As luck would have it, on February 23rd, 1987, they got their neutrinos. Two detectors, one beneath the city of Kamika, Japan, and the other under Lake Erie in Ohio, captured a dozen of the elusive particles. There were light detectors on this uh, volume of water that were used to see this little flash caused by the neutrino inter interacting with matter inside the tank. For the first time ever, scientists on Earth saw tangible evidence of the mysterious neutrino particles generated in the core of an exploding star. Astronomers now knew the theories first proposed in the 1930s were right. Supernova 1987A showed beyond a shadow of a doubt that the massive iron core of a very massive star collapsed and formed a neutron star. Because in that process, a lot of neutrinos should be emitted. With the deployment of powerful space-based telescopes, astronomers today have built on the astonishing discoveries made in the wake of supernova 1987A. In 2006, 30-year-old astronomer Robert Quimby would once again turn conventional thinking on its head and revolutionize the way astronomers searched for supernovas. Most supernova searches, they just want to find as many supernovas as possible, so they'll look once every two weeks, every one week, just, just so you can find them and so you can look at as many fields as possible and get as many supernova as possible. So I decided to look at a limited number of fields and look at them as often as I can. The enterprising cosmic gumshoe programmed his robotic telescope to systematically sweep the targeted field every night. Like an interstellar searchlight, it honed in on and methodically scanned the same small dark corner of the cosmos, looking for supernova suspects. 
I had software that can very quickly process the data and tell me if there's anything there that wasn't there before. And when that happens, if I think it could be a supernova, I'll get a spectrum of it. And then that spectrum of it will tell me exactly what it is. Is it a supernova? What type is it? Et cetera. On September 18, 2006, Quimby got his big break. He found the brightest supernova ever. This is my fourth supernova. I didn't think that I should be so lucky. And others looked at the spectra, and they started taking their own measurements of the, of the photometry, how bright it was. And they figured out that, in fact, 2006 GY was brighter than any other published supernova. Very slowly, it took uh, over two months, 70 days, to get the maximum light and, and then fade it again. So it was a supernova unlike anything we'd ever seen before, discovered by this fourth year graduate student at the University of Texas. Analysis of the remnant indicated that the star, before it exploded, was 100 times the size of the sun. And with lots of hydrogen showing in its spectrum, the brightest supernova ever recorded bore the stamp of a type two event. Then Quimby topped himself. When he finally analyzed a seemingly insignificant supernova he found earlier, called SN 2005 AP, he made a stunning discovery. It was something like 100 billion times as bright as the sun. As compared to, for a type 1A supernova, the peak may be only 6 billion times as bright as the sun. It was even brighter than SN 2006 GY. Like circumstantial evidence, astonishing discoveries of new ultra-bright supernovas like 2005 AP and others have opened up a whole new avenue of inquiry into exploding stars and their MO. The basic idea we have is that perhaps this is connected somehow to gamma ray bursts. Gamma rays are the most powerful form of light known in the universe. By analyzing supernovas, investigators are getting closer than ever to solving some of the most confounding riddles in the cosmos. How one of them makes gamma rays and the other makes an ordinary supernova is still one of the big mysteries. Nobody really knows how that works. What astronomers do know is that supernovas and the gamma ray bursts associated with them are the brightest beacons in the universe. On the galactic highway that is the cosmos, supernovas serve as celestial signposts pointing astronomers to the beginning and the end of time and space. NASA's powerful Swift satellite, launched in 2004, was designed specifically to sweep the sky and detect gamma ray bursts in the universe. Like cosmic first responders, astrophysicists at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Baltimore, Maryland, are standing by 24 seven, waiting for a 911 call from Swift Basically, less than two minutes after Swift discovered a gamma ray burst, the satellite sends down emails directly to a black burst. When a recent supernova, recorded as SN 2006 AJ, appeared, the Swift satellite caught the shocking gamma rays it generated. And that gamma ray burst was very interesting because, first of all, it was a very long duration gamma ray burst. Usually gamma ray bursts are very short-lived phenomena, only fractions of a second or a few seconds. But this gamma ray burst was visible for like 35 minutes. We saw three days later a supernova explosion going off at the exact same location. And this solved one of the important mysteries of gamma ray bursts because we found out that at least uh, parts of gamma ray bursts are due to massive stars that are exploding. Astronomers today can see hundreds of supernovas and the deadly gamma ray bursts they generate. On the cosmic highway, scientists use these stellar headlights to ascertain the bounds and breadth of the universe. You can use supernova to probe the universe because if they're very dim, 
you know they were very far away, and then you can study the curvature of space-time and all of the cosmology that you can study with them. For example, if you're on a desert highway and you're looking out at the lights of the cars, you can tell which are nearby and which are far away from the apparent brightness of the lights. The ones that are nearby look bright, the ones that are far away look dim. Measuring how far away things are very systematically will tell you about the size, the age, the shape, the history, the future of the universe. It turns out that Type 1A supernovas are the best suited for this purpose. One of the things that's really interesting about the Type 1A supernovae, the ones that are exploding white dwarfs, is that there is this fixed mass, this Chandrasekhar mass, that sets how big the explosion is, how much stuff is involved. And the consequence of that is that many of these have very nearly the same brightness. If the explosion produces the same amount of light, then we can measure how much light we see and figure out how far away the supernova is. This is known as the standard candle principle. Type 1A supernovae are like standard candles. They all have about the same peak power, the same peak luminosity. So if you look at them from different distances, they appear different apparent brightnesses. They look dimmer if they're farther away and brighter if they're more nearby. So if we find type 1A supernovae in distant galaxies and measure their apparent brightness and compare that with the known power of a nearby type 1A supernova, we can determine the distance of that supernova and hence of the galaxy in which it's located. The trailblazing technique has also led astro-investigators to some radical conclusions. Basically, we can use the distances to supernovae to figure out what the universe is doing, how old it is, and we, we now know that from various lines of evidence that it's a little less than 14 billion years old, but in particular, found out that the universe was accelerating when we thought it was decelerating in the grip of the gravitational materials in it. That just caused an intellectual revolution. It's like throwing a ball up towards the ceiling and rather than having it come back down into your hand, it goes faster and faster and faster towards the ceiling. It's completely counterintuitive. Basically all the text, astronomy textbooks out there all said that the universe should be decelerating. That is, gravity should be slowing down the expansion rate. But what this result showed is that instead of slowing down, it was actually expanding faster and faster and faster. While the examination of supernovas has helped scientists unravel many monumental cosmic mysteries, experts believe that if they continue to follow the clues left behind when huge stars explode, they'll be able to answer the biggest unanswered questions. Today, scientists know that someday soon, we could each witness for ourselves the marvelous and almighty force of a supernova. Our galaxy is 100,000 light years across, so that means there's light from 1,000 supernovae that's on its way to us now. It could even happen in our very own Milky Way. In our galaxy, we are expected to have an average of about two supernova explosions per century. The problem is that the last supernova that we saw in our galaxy is almost 400 years ago. So our galaxy is long overdue. If it did happen in our own galaxy, we, like the titans of space and time, Tycho, Kepler, Chandrasekhar, and Zwicky, would bear witness to the most destructive and the most creative force in the universe, the supernova. intrigued man for centuries, captivating astronomers and astrologers alike. A mysterious alignment between the Great Pyramids of Giza and the stars of Orion could have been more than a coincidence. And instead of 12 zodiac constellations, we actually have 13. What is our 13th sign, and why was it forgotten? The patterns that once navigated mariners across treacherous waters now guide astronomers to uncover the mysteries that lie within the constellations. If 
before the internet, before movies, the night sky and the constellations were the greatest show in town. This gallery of stars forms more than just pretty pictures. It contains an enormous sampling of star types. Through constellations, we can learn a lot about the galaxy and the universe beyond. Before we had high-tech navigation devices, GPS, or even compasses, we had stars. Like landmarks along the road, constellations can help us find our way. They give us direction, distance, and a sense of where to go. So on Earth, when we want to tell where something is, we give its coordinates in latitude and longitude. And what that means on Earth is it's a measure of, latitude is a measure of the distance between the North Pole and the South Pole, and longitude is the east-west distance, so the other direction. Similarly, we have a celestial coordinate system. But the coordinates, they're not called latitude and longitude. They're called declination and right ascension. They are just direct extensions of latitude and longitude on Earth, projected out into the sky. Ancient navigators used this imaginary grid to plot stars and orient themselves across the seas. Not a precise kind of indicator of direction, uh, but certainly a cue to keep people reminded of what the broad uh, pathways through the seas might be. By using a sextant, mariners were able to use guide stars like Polaris to navigate. This is a sextant. It's a uh, tool you use in celestial navigation. Once a celestial body hits what's called its lower limb to the horizon, you'd mark the position. Using the time and the numbers on this sextant, you can then use it in fixing your position at sea. Today's navigation uses man-made stars, satellites. With the use of our man-made stars, per se, our GPS positions and uh, differential GPS, we're able to fix the ship's position within a few yards instantaneously anywhere we are in the world. Now that GPS has replaced sextants, celestial coordinates are more important to astronomers than they are to sailors. Even though the coordinate system gives them an idea of where to point their telescopes, the grid falls short in a serious way. It assumes all the stars are all the same distance from us, an assumption that's flat out wrong. When you look at the stars in the night sky, they all appear to be about the same distance away, as if they were in the same plane. The same happens when you look at a, a city skyline from a distance away, such as we are from the Chicago skyline. So while those buildings look like they're the same distance, they're really at many different distances away. The same is true of the stars. While they all look like they're at the same distance, some are close, some are much further away. So how do we know which stars are close and which are far away? As it turns out, that's the most difficult question of all. That's been the single greatest frustration in all of astronomy. Looking at the night sky, even with telescopes, you cannot tell distances. That's been the holy grail of astronomy for centuries. We're here in the Angeles National Forest, and I've got with me a handy trail map. And I'd like to take a hike, uh, maybe going to, say, Switzer Falls, which on my map looks like it's not very far, only maybe a mile. But the trouble is, I could badly underestimate the difficulty of this hike, because my flat map here fails to take into account one very significant factor, which is the elevation. So. In fact, my simple one-mile hike could turn out to be a 5,000-foot climb. So does my constellation map fail to tell me about the true distance between two stars. Even though in a constellation they might look like they're right next to each other, in fact, one could be much farther away than the other, and I would never know it if I just looked at the celestial coordinates only. Like hikers in the woods, Astronomers rely on clues to help them gauge the distances in our vast and mysterious universe. So when we're hiking in the forest, even if we don't have a map that tells us elevation, we can use our knowledge of the local topography and types of trees to tell us something about our altitude. 
For example, certain trees prefer lower elevation, whereas other trees prefer higher altitudes. Similarly, astronomers use certain types of reference stars as guideposts, familiar guideposts, as a gauge of distance. The first tool in the astronomer's kit is the phenomenon of parallax. It's something we use on a smaller scale every day to see the world in three dimensions. The way to think of parallax is a very simple exercise that everybody can do. So take a look at your finger and look at something really, really far away. If you use your right eye and line up your finger with a distant object and then use your left eye, you'll see that your finger actually appears to move quite dramatically. This apparent shift is caused by the distance between our two eyes. Astronomers measure parallax by looking at a star at one position and then looking at it again six months later when it's moved as far as it could go from our vantage point. Six months is really when the Earth is as far away from that original position as it can be. The closer the star, the greater the parallax. The problem is that stars aren't very close. Even the parallax angle of our closest star, Proxima Centauri, is difficult to measure. It's less than a second of arc. What's a second of arc? There's 360 degrees in a circle. In every degree, there are 60 minutes of arc. And in every minute of arc, there are 60 seconds of arc. Proxima Centauri has a parallax of 0.7 seconds of arc. So it's very small. To span the distance to more far-flung stars, astronomers count on a familiar guidepost to lead them. Much like the Coast Guard uses a lighthouse. The men and women of the Coast Guard know that every lighthouse has a particular pulsation frequency. One might flash two times a minute, another four times. They can use this to determine exactly their position, just based on the pattern. In the same way, astronomers can use a cosmic lighthouse called a Cepheid variable star. The constellation Cepheus, named after the mythical king of Ethiopia, claims 57 visible stars, including Delta Cephei, a variable star that is the prototype for Cepheid variables. By a quirk of nature, Cepheids keep time like a metronome. The bigger and brighter the Cepheid, the slower it will pulsate. So what you do is find a Cepheid variable, measure its pulsation period, it might be 10 days or 60 days, and then you've got a standard candle. You can determine how far away that star is. A standard candle is a basis of comparison, a star of known luminosity and distance that we can compare similar stars against. You know, a light bulb gives off the amount of light it gives off, a certain amount of watts. But that light is going to look a lot brighter if you're right up close to that light bulb than if you are 10 feet away. And so the luminosity of a star doesn't change. You know, that is what it is. But apparent magnitude, you know, depends on where you are, how far away you are, whether you're right up close to something or you're seeing it from the other side of the street. If a Cepheid doesn't appear that bright, then it must be far away. Astronomers can calculate how far it is based on how dim it appears. Looking at my Cepheid variable and plotting the light curve, how long it takes to go from brightness to dim to back to brightness again, tells me what the intrinsic brightness of that star is. So I can calculate distance to variable stars by observing the period of their variation. That's how Edwin Hubble was able to determine that Andromeda was two million light years outside our galaxy. But Cepheid variables have their limits. To measure distances far beyond Andromeda, astronomers rely on supernovas. It turns out that supernovae can also be categorized as standard candles 
Type 1A supernovae are all the same throughout the universe. We know how to calibrate them. And that's how we determine the distances out to the Big Bang in the very edges of the universe. Peering into the Big Bang, scientists can nearly see the beginning of time. 300,000 years after the Big Bang. Even our most familiar constellations have a lot to teach us about the cosmos. Orion, which is Greek for hunter, has 77 visible stars. Alnidoc, Alnilam, and Mintaka make up the three stars in Orion's belt. In modern times, astronomers have hunted Orion, finding a variety of astonishing objects. When I see Orion, I also see the life and death of stars. Just below the belt, there's a little smudge called the Orion Nebula, and that's a nursery, a nursery for baby stars, and you can actually see that with the naked eye. Orion has also bagged a pair of stellar gems. If you look at the upper left-hand shoulder of Orion, you see the red giant Betelgeuse, and if you immediately look right down to the lower right star, the star that's sort of his, his leg, uh, you'll see the blue supergiant Rigel. Betelgeuse, as a red supergiant, is a star in its death throes. A red supergiant is a star that is actually quite a bit cooler than our sun, but much, much larger. Betelgeuse is 14 times more massive than our sun. When it runs out of nuclear fuel, Betelgeuse will become unstable and implode in a colossal supernova. It can detonate at any time. And when it explodes, it will light up the entire night sky, and it will even be visible during daytime. And maybe it's already blown up. It's 427 light years from Earth, which means that perhaps it has already exploded, but light hasn't had time to reach us yet. The supernova will draw more attention to a sky that's been captivating us for thousands of years. The ancient Egyptians consulted the heavens to tell them when to plant and when to harvest. Every star possessed a sacred meaning. They called Sirius in the constellation Canis Major, the star of Isis. Sirius's appearance before dawn during the summer solstice forecasted the annual rise of the Nile River. Other constellations, like Orion, might have had a certain architectural significance. Egyptologists have often asked the question, why did the ancient Egyptians build three great pyramids that are slightly misaligned? Did they have bad ruler sticks thousands of years ago? The three pyramids seem to be aligned to the three constellation stars of Orion. What does this alignment mean? Was it a coincidence, or were the pyramids intentionally engineered this way? The pyramids of Giza seduce us with archaeological mystery and historical intrigue. Some scientists think the pyramids have a certain astronomical importance. It has been claimed that the layout of the three major pyramids on the Giza Plateau, including the Great Pyramid, are set on the ground to mimic the three stars in Orion's belt. It's one of my favorite connections between events on Earth and events in the sky. But the ancient Egyptians didn't see a hunter in Orion like we do. They saw Osiris, god of rebirth. Some speculate that air shafts within the Great Pyramids were specifically designed to catapult the souls of pharaohs to the heavens. In those pyramids, we have two different shafts, and those shafts, one points north, one points south. The south shaft points toward Orion. So the soul of the pharaoh would be launched through that shaft in order to be connected to Osiris, Orion, and be resurrected again, enjoying eternal life. But others are a bit more skeptical. In order to make it match correctly, you have to flip it upside down on the ground or in the sky. That the Egyptians did place an importance on north and on south, 
in the pyramid. And it doesn't make any sense to say, well, yes, they lined the stars up right, but then when it came to mapping on the ground, it was perfectly okay to flip everything around and make it upside down. The north shaft points toward one specific star. The one pointing north points to the pole star at the time, 2,000 years before Christ, 2,000 BC, 3,000 BC, and that pole star was Thuban. Thuban is located in the constellation Draco, or the dragon. Draco has 79 visible stars. Thuban has been replaced by our generation's pole star, Polaris. Polaris illuminates the Arctic, governing our sky as a beacon over the North Pole. Lying in the constellation Ursa Minor, it's 2,500 times brighter than the Sun. Outshining its companion stars, Polaris, A, B, and B. Although it's ruled the heavens as our North Star for as long as we can remember, its reign won't last forever. As Earth orbits the Sun, it teeters back and forth. This wobbling is called precession. If Earth was a perfect sphere, it wouldn't precess. But the gravitational poles of the Moon and Sun tug at the bulging equator, upsetting Earth's spin. Now the Earth is like a gyroscope or a spinning top. Notice that if I spin this very rapidly and then I move the axis, it points in the same direction. This is the Earth pointing toward Polaris, that as the Earth goes around the Sun, it always points in the same direction. However, precession is caused by gravitational interference, so the Earth begins to wobble. As Earth wobbles, its axis draws a circle in the sky. It takes 26,000 years to make one complete circle. The North Celestial Pole will move further and further away from the position of Polaris. In about 14,000 years from now, about halfway around its circle, it will be very close to the bright star Vega. But because Vega is so much brighter than any other star in that part of the sky, it will be a very significant north polar star. In 26,000 years, Earth's axis, centered on the North Pole, will make one complete circle and it will point back to where it is today. And Polaris will overthrow Vega and reclaim its title as our North Star. The closer a star is to one of Earth's poles, the more its position remains fixed in the sky. Astronomers call these stars circumpolar, meaning that they're visible all year long. In fact, all of the constellation of northern stars, such as the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper, just go around in a fairly small circle. So the result of that, they go around Polaris without ever rising and setting. The further south you go, the more constellations actually rise, say at the beginning of the night and set at the end of the night, and so they don't have that magical property. Stars vary in size, density, and also brightness. Instead of shining with a steady glow like most stars, variable stars pulsate, brightening and dimming in a hypnotic pattern. A variable star is like a pot of tea. You take a kettle and put it on a burner and it starts to expand and then it releases its excess energy and then drops. And then it starts to build up pressure and then it drops again. So kind of in the same way, the variable star's atmospheres expand and shrink with time, and this makes the star appear to get brighter and dimmer. Sometimes this happens over a matter of hours, sometimes it can be days or even months. A special class of variable stars called T. Tauri stars pulsate because they're young and unstable. Like stubborn teenagers, T. Tauri stars have erratic outbursts. Except their tantrums involve a struggle with gravity. As the uh, nuclear forces push it outward, gravity pulls it back in, and it misses that equilibrium position, sort of like a pendulum, and it oscillates back and forth. T. Tauris will outgrow their pulsations. As they age, they'll reach equilibrium, becoming stable stars. In fact, before our sun matured, 
scientists think that it used to be a T. tori. This probably gives us our best look at what our solar system and our sun looked like when it had just formed in its earliest evolution. And we know that, for example, that the clouds of dust and gas around these stars are very messy, and it must have been a pretty violent scene with many lunks and chunks of rock colliding into each other and bombarding each other. The first T. Tauri stars were identified in the constellation Taurus. Taurus, the bull, possesses 98 visible stars. Aldebaran, a red giant star, is the bull's bloodshot eye. Taurus is one of the zodiac constellations that lie near the plane of the ecliptic. It's called the ecliptic plane because that's the only circle around the sky where eclipses can occur. The moon has to pass through the ecliptic, for example, in order to give us an eclipse of the sun. It's also the path that our Earth travels along as we orbit the sun. Eight degrees above and below the ecliptic lies a region called the zodiac. Every constellation that falls within this band is referred to as a zodiac constellation. At any given time, the sun is in a constellation of the zodiac. The sun lies between us on the Earth and a certain constellation. Because we orbit our sun, the sun appears to move through zodiac constellations that are fixed in the sky. During nighttime, the opposite portion of our sky is lit by the sun. Astrologers linked each of the 12 zodiac constellations to the month that the sun passes through. So in June, the sun sweeps through Cancer, and in July, it glides across Leo. But you see, there's a problem with that. Each constellation is of different sizes. Some are small, some are big. It takes the sun seven days to pass through Scorpius, the smallest zodiac constellation, and 44 days to clear Virgo, the largest. So you cannot divide the year into 12 equal pieces with 12 equally shaped constellations. A lot of people put a great deal of significance on their zodiac sign, their sun sign. But in reality, since the Earth is processing, the constellation in which the sun appears today is different from the constellation in which it appeared 2,000 years ago. So the next time someone tells you that you're competitive because you're a Scorpio, tell them, well, you know, today I'm really not a Scorpio anymore. From the infamous what's your sign line to predicting fortunes and defining personality traits, the 12 signs of the zodiac have played a substantial role in pop culture. But where do these signs come from? And who named the stars? We have original names for stars, in some cases, that came to us from Mesopotamia. Some names were added to the stars by the Greeks and the Romans. Some of those survived, some of them did not. With the collapse of the Roman Empire in about 450 AD, much of this knowledge was lost. However, it was preserved by the Arabs. And in fact, much of astronomy survives today because of the Arabic astronomers preserving and augmenting the calculations and work of the Greek and Roman astronomers. In 150 AD, Greek scientist Claudius Ptolemy merged his own observations with historical writings, labeling more than 1,000 stars. And out of all the constellations that cover our skies, we've learned that 12 are zodiac constellations. But in reality, there are 13. Even if we're not followers of astrology, most of us know what our astrological sign is. What most of us don't know is that instead of having 12 zodiac constellations, there are actually 13. Ophiuchus, which is Greek for the serpent bearer, is our forgotten sign. It has 55 visible stars and is home to Bernard's star, which is the fastest moving star through our night sky. Nestled between Scorpius and Sagittarius, 
Ophiuchus dwarfs the constellations it surrounds. Although it was one of the original 48 star patterns that Ptolemy cataloged, some scientists speculate that it might have been dropped as a zodiac sign to keep an even number of 12. Others think that precession could have nudged Ophiuchus off the zodiac. But the real answer remains a mystery. The only star in the universe that doesn't belong to a specific constellation is our sun. Comparatively speaking, the sun is a typical aging star with an average mass. But stars that have about 50 to 100 times the mass of our sun are called wolf Rayae stars. The brightest observable wolf Rayae is called Gamma Velorum in the constellation Vela. These massive stars are incredibly luminous and are in their final stages of evolution. The reason they get so luminous that they're pouring out energy and radiation so furiously, it's actually powerful enough to push off the outer layers of the star's atmosphere. These stars literally evaporate themselves from all the heat and radiation that they're generating, leaving behind just the very, very hot central core. Although scientists haven't directly observed the death of any, they speculate that Wolf Rayae stars will end their lives in colossal supernova explosions, or possibly collapse into massive black holes. But before they do, they put on a very spectacular show of blowing out all of their outer layers of gas into the interstellar medium. Today, our network of ground and space-based telescopes allows astronomers to see any point in the sky. But ancient astronomers in the Northern Hemisphere couldn't see that the Southern Hemisphere looks out on an entirely different view. If you're in the Southern Hemisphere, the most prominent feature in the night sky is the Milky Way. And in the Milky Way, you have these zones that are dark, they're dust clouds. But when you look at them from Earth, they're just dark against the backdrop of the very bright Milky Way and all the stars, it's the most noticeable thing. These dark clouds appear as holes within the Milky Way's starry swath. There's such a distinctive pattern, these holes, that some civilizations, in particular the Incas in South America, identified these black splotches, these absorptions, as constellations themselves. These dense patches of dust are known as dark cloud constellations. There is an amazing, complete blackout of stars in a region near the center, the direction near the center of the galaxy, and it's called the coal sack. It's just such a dense cloud of dust. It just blocks out all the light from the stars behind it. Today, the coal sack lies in the constellation Crux. Crux, commonly called the Southern Cross, is the smallest constellation, and 20 stars are visible. Sailors relied on Alpha and Gamma Crux to locate the South Pole, since there is no pole star like Polaris in the Southern Hemisphere. As astronomy developed, the scientific community realized it needed to unify the names and shapes of the constellations. In 1922, a group formed called the International Astronomical Union. They were sort of the political body of scientists assigned to divide up the sky, set up boundaries so that everybody could agree, here are the boundaries. Those boundaries were based on historic constellations. The IAU adopted most of Ptolemy's original constellations and added more to include every visible star with no overlaps. Some of them were named more recently in the Southern Hemisphere uh, when Western Europeans uh, got a really good look at the southern skies. In all, 88 official constellations cover the night sky. But there are other small collections of stars that form obvious patterns called asterisms, like the Little Dipper and Big Dipper. The Big Dipper is made out of Ursa Major's brightest stars. Ursa Major, or the Great Bear, has 71 visible stars. The Big Dipper is recognized by its resemblance to a ladle. The Big Dipper is probably the easiest object in the sky to find, even if you don't know anything else. 
For being such a familiar asterism, the Big Dipper is still full of surprises. The second star in its handle, named Mizar, looks like a single point of light, but a closer look reveals that it's five blazing stars. Cygnus, the swan, claims 79 visible stars. A star named Deneb is a thermonuclear powerhouse that forms the swan's tail. At 200 times the diameter of our sun and as much as 250,000 times as bright, Deneb is one of the largest examples of a white supergiant star. It's a star in a very unusual phase of its evolution. There's very few stars like that, and they don't spend very much time of their lives in such a high luminosity state. White supergiants are rare because the star is transitioning from a red to a blue supergiant, a phase that only lasts a few million years. This may sound like a long time by human standards, but for a star, it's less than 1% of its lifetime. For a constellation named after a graceful bird, Cygnus bears the scars of a violent past. So Cygnus is also home to something called the Cygnus Loop, which is a supernova remnant. Uh, there was a star that blew itself to bits, basically. A gaping black hole called Cygnus X1 lies in the swan's heart. Cygnus X1 is an 8.7 solar mass black hole, so it's 8.7 times the mass of our sun that's orbiting another star. Cygnus X1 was the first black hole to ever be recorded. In fact, we first detected Cygnus X1, not so much because of the black hole, because it's black, it's very hard to see, but because of its effect on its companion, uh, which is this giant star. And in fact, the black hole is slowly devouring the companion and eventually we'll probably swallow it up. And when it does, a constellation will lose a star, and our perception of the night sky will change forever. Our night sky is in constant change. Within each constellation, stars are born, while others are swallowed by black holes. Every supernova explosion, exotic star, and nebula has one thing in common. They are identified by the constellation they're located in. But even before we invented high-powered telescopes to see them, constellations served an important purpose. They brought people the nightly news that they dared not ignore. It was a question of life and death. You see, the night sky is a calendar. That was the very first scientific invention of us humans, the calendar in the sky. The rising and setting of the sun, the changing phases of the moon, the seasonal reappearances and disappearances of the stars. People see that there is, in fact, an order to the world. They, in fact, see order in the sky that is useful for them to anticipate what's happening on the Earth. That's a tool for survival. When you look at the sky, you see these groups of stars that are connected to important events that will prompt you to behave in certain ways or to move in certain ways or to plant or harvest. Besides seeing the pattern of stars changing with the seasons, the ancients made another crucial observation the shifting stellar canopy shaped their world. Travelers who went a long way south, for example, from Greece, started being able to see different constellations from any of the constellations that have been visible in their hometown. So it's telling you that you're really moving on a curved surface and changing your perspective. Today, we understand the shape of the Earth and the parade of the seasons. But constellations haven't outlived their usefulness. Instead of telling us about the Earth, they're helping us make sense of the stars. A constellation is a lot like an art museum. In an art museum, you'll see artists who have used different kinds of materials, painting, photographs, and ordinary objects. A constellation also has similar objects, 
but made of different materials. Some of them have more helium or hydrogen or carbon, silicon, iron, and yet we can group them together. In both cases, the objects that are gathered in an art museum or a constellation, they're artificial collections that we've put together for some reason. Like countries, constellations divide the sky into territories. When you say Orion, I know exactly what part of the sky you're talking about. So to an astronomer, a constellation really is kind of a handy map. It's just a way of organizing things, so we kind of know where stuff is. And even though the night sky is infinite, we can see only a sampling of stars before dust and distance blocks our view. You'll probably see on a very dark night maybe 1,500 to 2,000 stars with your naked eye if you're not using binoculars or anything. So what we're seeing is only a tiny, tiny fraction of what's really out there. That would be sort of like looking at the whole population of the United States, 350 million Americans, and seeing five people. Centaurus, or the Centaur, contains 101 visible stars. Two of its stars, Alpha and Beta Centauri, are the brightest stars in our night sky. Centaurus holds Alpha Centauri, the star nearest to the Earth after our own sun. And a closer look reveals that Alpha Centauri is actually a triple star system. It's not unusual for stars to share the spotlight with one or two orbiting co-stars. In fact, it's the norm. Over 60% of the stars you see in the heavens are actually double stars, triple stars, quadruple stars. Our sun is an exception. Our sun apparently has no companion. While our sun makes its lonely voyage through space, the stars of Omega Centauri never lack company. It is the brightest globular star cluster that you can see without a telescope, just with a naked eye, because it is a giant cluster of about 10 million stars. Omega Centauri is the largest star cluster in our galaxy. These tightly bound stars all have different, complicated orbits, but they still manage to move together as a single group. Where the cluster comes from is anyone's guess. It's an unusual object, and a lot of astronomers su suspect that this might be the center of a galaxy which got eaten, consumed by the Milky Way when it fell in. It certainly happens fairly often that big galaxies are cannibals and they eat little galaxies and Omega Centauri may be a remnant of this process. The light from Alpha Centauri takes about 4.2 years to reach us. But when we look at Omega Centauri, we're seeing light that's traveled 16,000 years. That's some indication of how large Centaurus really is. It also shows that a constellation exists only in our mind's eye. And each star, like every piece of art, begs to be explored. The constellations organize the night sky and make it almost comprehensible. As we gaze at the twinkling lights, it's easy to forget that each is one of billions of blazing suns, fusing elements and possibly creating new worlds. Our distance gives us no sense of the star's power. It also gives us no sense of the endless depth of space we're peering into. The flat planes of the constellations are an illusion. As you start getting away from the sun by several light years, the nearby stars begin shifting uh, relative to the more distant background stars. So the constellations start distorting. And by the time you're out at 10, 20, 30 light years, you probably would recognize few of the constellations. So if you lived on a planet going around uh, Vega, let's say, that's 25 light years away from here, you'd have a different set of constellations in your sky. Millennia of stargazing have made the grand sweep of the constellations predictable. Our rotation around the sun carries us through their annual cycle. 
The stars in the constellations are in constant motion, not just as the galaxy spins, but also as each star's gravity tugs and pulls on its neighbors. The fastest motion of the stars is 150 miles per second. We don't have any man-made object that can go that fast. The random motions of these stars with respect to each other are more like 10 or 20 miles a second, and that is comparable to the speed of our fastest spacecraft. That's, of course, way, way faster than a high-speed bullet. The stars are always moving, and their distance from us masks their enormous speed. It's like looking out the window of a speeding automobile. The fence posts and trees closest to the highway whiz by, while the distant landscape creeps slowly past. Over our lifetime, in fact, close to a thousand lifetimes, most stars don't appear to move at all. It just intrigues me to think that if I could find one of our, quote, recent relatives, a Cro-Magnon man, for example, he would probably correct me because he would be more familiar with the sky and he would know the constellations a little bit better than the people do today. But little by little, our star maps are reaching their expiration dates. In 10,000 years, the stars would be noticeably different. The constellations would be noticeably different than what we see now. In 500,000 years, they'd be unrecognizable. And if you truly could see a time-lapse photo over a period of a million years, you would, in fact, see stars racing around the sky. The constellations are a snapshot, a flattened portrait of the night sky. And like a portrait, it's a good likeness, but not the whole story. If we could fly into space and see them from another angle, these old familiar star formations would be unidentifiable. But right here, right now, the 88 constellations provide reassuring guideposts while reminding us of our past. The constellations really don't fulfill the functions that they fulfilled originally for the people that devised them. For them, there was a direct cause and effect connection between something that was of interest to them and their lives. They watched Sirius because it was a seasonal indicator. We don't use the sky that way anymore, but the stories are resilient and the images are resilient. We hold on to those constellations and frankly, I'm delighted we do. Instead of telling stories of the past, modern astronomy compels us to look at constellations as a grouping of possibilities. Most of the constellations have three to five planets inside them. And in a few more years, we're gonna identify perhaps hundreds of Earth-like planets orbiting other stars. So we will have this epiphany every night, realizing that when we look at the constellations, somebody may be looking back. In a space so vast that we can only see a small fraction of our universe, we look to the stars wondering what it all means. Making patterns, inventing stories, attempting to solve the mysteries that our constellations hold. Does our sun have a deadly nemesis that dooms life on our planet? Is it possible to travel through time? It is one of the greatest questions. What happened to matter's evil twin? The mind hunts for an explanation. How did the water on Mars disappear? And what came before the Big Bang? This is the greatest mystery in all of science. Big questions and cutting edge science. The universe, unexplained mysteries. Unexplained mysteries in the universe, one has a particular urgency for those of us who enjoy living on planet Earth. 
do Earthlings have a regularly scheduled date with extinction once every 26 million years? And if so, what causes this periodic hard rain of destruction? You have this enormous explosion. Anything within, within thousands of miles will be killed. You're talking here first of the blast wave of the tsunami. You're talking about the enormous heat. Fires all around the globe. And then darkness. For millions of years, enormous objects from space have slammed into Earth with disastrous results. One impact in the waters of the Yucatan Peninsula is blamed for the extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. But this wasn't the first mass extinction on Earth, and it probably won't be the last. And it wasn't the biggest mass extinction event of all time because that one was the Permian extinction in which 95% of the species in the oceans died and about 80% of those on land. So radical extinction events have happened. Some scientists believe these periods of death and destruction happen like clockwork. Some paleontologists found a very strange pattern. What they found were the great extinctions, such as the ones that killed the dinosaurs, but others too didn't happen at random times but seemed to occur on a regular time schedule. That was very strange. They were disappearing every 26 million years, was begging for an explanation. Astrophysicist Richard Muller believes the explanation for this periodic destruction is a dim red dwarf star lurking on the edge of the solar system. A star that he fittingly calls Nemesis. According to his theory, Nemesis is an undiscovered companion star to our own sun. It travels between one and three light years from the center of the solar system on an elongated elliptical orbit. As Nemesis makes its closest approach to the sun every 26 million years, its orbit takes it right through the Oort cloud, a collection of an estimated trillion comets surrounding our solar system. That's when the order of the solar system turns especially chaotic. When that happens, Nemesis gets close to the comets and perturbs their orbit. According to Muller's theory, the gravitational disruption caused by this small, innocuous star causes long, undisturbed comets to break away from their orbits in the Oort cloud. Pulled towards the sun by its gravity, a billion comets are sent careening toward the inner solar system. A handful inevitably cross paths with the Earth, resulting in massive impacts and mass extinctions. The claim that our sun has an undiscovered companion Death Star is controversial. Most scientists believe that the sun is a solitary star with no companions. But in the universe, binary or even triplet stars grouped together by gravity are the norm. The majority of stars in our galaxy are parts of either binary or triple stars. And so the idea that the sun conceivably could be part of a binary isn't, isn't crazy from that point of view at all. It's, uh, it's an interesting question. Even if the sun could conceivably have a binary companion, 
Astronomers have never observed a binary system in which the pair of stars are as far apart as Muller claims our Sun and Nemesis would be. Muller needed proof that Nemesis was real. In 1997, a NASA mission began that had the potential to shed light on the mystery. The Two Micron All Sky Survey, or Two Mass, used twin infrared telescopes to scour the universe for previously unknown stars. Two Mass specialized in hard to find bodies in and near our galaxy and to date has produced over two million images. If Nemesis was out there, two mass should have spotted it. But the survey never detected anything fitting the description of Muller's Death Star. We've looked. We've looked real hard for Death Star, for Nemesis, and we can't find it anywhere. But Muller isn't surprised two mass didn't find his nemesis. The reason is at a distance of about one light year, which is the distance it would have in order to have a 26 million year orbit, its motion is very little. And so it would have been missed by the standard surveys that look for nearby stars. Another possibility is that nemesis may actually be a brown dwarf. These failed stars are much smaller than red dwarfs. And with a highly elliptical orbit, a brown dwarf would remain far from Earth most of the time and out of the watchful eye of astronomers. If that's the case, Nemesis could have easily slipped under the two-mass radar. Richard Muller vows to continue looking and plans yet another, more detailed study. He believes it's only a matter of time before Nemesis is found. There are lots of stars out there. There are millions of them. But when you find a needle in a haystack, you can look at it and say, well, that's not hay. Similarly with this, when we find Nemesis, we'll measure the orbit and we'll prove that it's Nemesis. the unexplained mysteries in our universe. Perhaps the most tantalizing and controversial is whether it's possible to travel through time. Can we really travel back into the past? Can we really alter our destiny? It is one of the greatest questions. In 1955, Ron Mallett was only 10 years old when his father died of a heart attack. Grief-stricken, young Mallett yearned for a way he could see his father again and perhaps save his life. About a year after he died, I came across H.G. Wells' book, The Time Machine, and that is what saved me because I thought if I could build a time machine, as H.G. Wells talked about, then I could go back into the past and try to save his life and see him again. And so I became obsessed with the notion of trying to build a time machine. Gentlemen, I am talking about traveling through time. The time machine was a work of fiction. But Mallet soon discovered there was science to support the mysterious notion of time travel. And the source was none other than Albert Einstein. Einstein theorized that space and time were linked so that one could imagine space-time as a sort of fabric or sheet. With his general theory of relativity, Einstein showed that a massive object, like a planet, a star, or black hole, actually warps the fabric of space and time. 
In fact, Einstein believed that gravity, the force that binds us to the Earth and keeps the Earth in orbit around the sun, is really just an effect of this warping. For Mallet, this mind and universe bending idea has far reaching implications. Because if you could generate enough gravity to twist time into a loop, perhaps you could create a pathway for moving backwards and forwards through time. Einstein's theories fueled Ron Mallet's quest to learn how to build his own time machine. But time travel wasn't a subject that could be studied by serious scientists out in the open. As a matter of fact, I used the cover story that worked for me. I studied black holes because black holes allowed me to understand how Einstein's theory affected time. And every it was a crazy idea, but it was considered legitimate crazy. So I built my career on studying that and being able to use Einstein's general theory of relativity. Black holes, the massive remnants of collapsed stars, have an almost unmatched gravitational power to distort space and time, which is exactly what Mallet wanted to do. But how could he create in the laboratory something jam-packed with enough matter to actually warp space-time? For inspiration, Mallet turned again to Einstein and his most famous equation. E equals mc squared, which showed that matter and energy are just different forms of the same thing. So following Einstein's theory, light, which is energy, should be able to warp space and time just like a massive object does. We're used to the notion that gravity is created by matter. But it turns out that in Einstein's theory, light can create gravity. And that is what my work is based on. In other words, if gravity can affect time and light can create gravity, then light can affect time. Mallet has built a model to demonstrate his concept that a circulating laser beam can create a tunnel of light that twists space and time. It has four intersecting laser beams. The region within that column of light would represent the region in which space is being twisted. And eventually, time would also get twisted by this column of light. and this would allow us to travel back into the past. The first time traveler will have to be something much smaller than a human being, a subatomic particle like a neutron. What we're trying to do is not human beings, but to try to send subatomic particles information to that. And that is a huge leap in itself, because imagine if we can send information back into the past that could tell us about future disasters and be able to avert those disasters. We can understand how circulating light beam can twist space and time by a simple analogy with a cup of coffee. If we think of the coffee in the cup as being like empty space and we think of the spoon as being like a circulating light beam, then you can see what happens to the coffee as I stir it. The coffee swirls around. Well, that's what the circulating light beam is doing to empty space. And we can see the effect of this in the case of the coffee by putting in a coffee bean. As I swirl it around, the coffee bean gets swirled around. In the case of the laser, as the beam is circulating, we put a subatomic particle called a neutron in. And as we stir the space around, the neutron will get swirled around, just like the coffee bean. Now, remember, in Einstein's theory, space and time are connected, so that swirling of space will cause the straight line of time to be swirled into a loop. And along that loop in time, we can go from the past to the present to the future, and then back into the past.
science fiction has depicted time machines as allowing unrestrained travel forward and backwards in time. But Mallet cautions that a time traveler could only journey back as far as the moment that the time machine was first turned on. In other words, if I turn the device on today and I leave it on for 100 years, then someone 100 years from now could travel back 75 years, 50 years, 25 years, all the way back to the moment I turned the device on. But they can't travel earlier than that because the device didn't exist earlier than that. And it's the device that's creating the effect. So there's nothing for the time travel to materialize into. This limitation means that Mallet's time machine could never give him the capability to travel back to 1955 to save his father's life. To do that would take some technology from out of this world. Theoretically, an advanced alien civilization might have a time machine that was switched on thousands of years ago. We may be able to use their time travel to go back to visit our ancient past because if they have developed time travel, let's say 10,000 years ago, it would still have the same limitation. But once we encounter them, we could use it. And perhaps someday we may be able to visit ancient Egypt and ancient Rome. For now, Mallet is focused on getting his time machine built, a project that will require a quarter of a million dollars in startup costs alone. Money is just one obstacle facing any physicist daring to dabble in time travel. There are also certain paradoxes that many believe make time travel impossible, like the infamous grandfather paradox. Imagine you go back in time and kill your own grandfather before he meets your grandmother. Therefore, you never would have been born and therefore couldn't have gone back in time in the first place. And then a loop is set up of possible, impossible, happened, it didn't happen. But Mallet believes recent advances in theoretical physics suggest that these paradoxes aren't a problem at all. Many physicists now believe in the far-out notion that our universe is just one of many parallel universes. So that when you go back in time, you might actually be entering a parallel universe in which you can alter events without affecting the universe you came from. We believe that the river of time can have whirlpools whirlpools by which you may be able to go back and meet your parents before you're born. Or perhaps even fork into two rivers by which you can actually alter the past to create an alternate universe. These are all theories that are at the very forefront of modern physics today. Mallet believes we may be as little as a century away from time travel by humans. Still too late for him to travel back in time to save his father. Rocky, the Rocky. Nice to meet you. <laughs> okay, thank, thank you. you very much. Well. Remember what's happening in the space of swirling around. But his personal loss has opened a door for a new world for future generations. I developed the basic equations for this. It has led to my being able to share something with the world that I would never have been able to share before. And I feel that that is actually a fitting memorial to my father, that I've been able to do that. And I feel very good about that. as the universe was first forming. Scientists believe it was comprised of more than just the regular matter that now makes up everything around us. They believe it had an almost equal amount of antimatter, matter's elusive evil twin. 
if you go back to the very early universe, it turns out that it was made of matter and antimatter. It turns out that every particle has an antiparticle. And it sounds kind of crazy, but it's real. It's sort of sci-fi, you know, antimatter. But what is this mysterious antimatter, and where did all of it go? Antimatter is exactly like matter. The difference between it is the fact that it has completely different charge associated with Regular matter is made of atoms, which in turn are made of subatomic particles, like negatively charged electrons and positively charged protons. Antimatter are the opposite of these particles. They have the same mass, but the opposite electrical charge. Proton's a positively charged particle, that's the nucleus of the atom. The antiproton would be a negatively charged proton that has exactly the same mass. In our universe, opposites attract, and particles and antiparticles are pulled together. One would think this is a relationship made for the heavens. But every time matter comes in contact with antimatter, the outcome is the same. They annihilate each other. Imagine two spaceships hurtling through space on a collision course. One is made of regular matter. The other is an antimatter craft built by an alien civilization. The impact would be spectacular, and there will be no wreckage left behind for cosmic crash investigators to examine. The matter and the antimatter disappear, poof, they're, they're gone. But the, the energy doesn't disappear. The energy re-emerges in the form of two very energetic gamma rays, photons. And the amount of energy locked up in a tiny amount of mass is, is quite astonishing. If you take matter and antimatter and combine it, it is explosive. And in fact, it is one of the greatest sources of energy in the universe, the collision of matter and antimatter. So if I were you, I would not put antimatter in your pocket if you know it's good for you. Volatile as antimatter is when it meets matter, there's a tremendous energy potential if we knew how to harness it. So to get an idea how much energy is locked up in matter, uh, if you imagine for a minute that these two piles of sand are that one is matter and one is antimatter, and you let them come together, they would annihilate and produce energy. How much energy? Enough energy to power all of California for a week, just in those two piles of sand. The biggest mystery surrounding antimatter is this. If there were nearly equal amounts of matter and antimatter in the early universe, then where is all the antimatter now? One of the great mysteries of the universe is what happened to our evil twin, antimatter. Everywhere we look in the heavens, we see ordinary matter. We don't see antimatter. There's only a small amount of antimatter coming out of the center of the Milky Way galaxy. Why this universe appears to be made entirely of matter and there isn't much antimatter to be seen out there is a mystery. I don't think it'll ever be explained anyway, but um, the mind hunts for an explanation. One possibility is that perhaps there was a slightly higher percentage of matter than antimatter in the early universe. So as the particles and antiparticles collided in a war of annihilation, that small percentage of matter survived. The last living veterans of our most ancient battlefield. For every billion antiprotons, you need a billion and one protons. Then the billion all annihilate, and you're left with that one proton. And the leftover 
is us. We are the residue. We are the leftover of this titanic blast of energy released by the collision of matter and antimatter at the instant of time. Our most advanced theories cannot explain why there was this asymmetry between matter and antimatter. But thank God it exists. Otherwise, we wouldn't be here. But even though matter prevailed to make up everything we see around us, could there be distant galaxies or regions of space where antimatter still reigns supreme? It may be that there are entire galaxies that are just 99.9% .9 antimatter, just like this one is matter. And if an antimatter galaxy were to run into a matter galaxy, then they both would be annihilated in some stupendous flash of light and power. As strange as it is, scientists have learned how to create minute quantities of antimatter in laboratory accelerators for medical purposes. Particles of antimatter from decaying radioactive material are injected into the body to create PET scans of the brain. Many people don't realize that when they go to the hospital and have a PET scan, they're actually being injected with a source of antimatter. The P in PET corresponds to positrons. Positrons are anti-electrons. And when and it goes to some part of the body that they're trying to figure out what's going on. And then uh, when the positron's emitted, finds an electron very quickly, annihilates with it, and the gamma rays come out of the body and are detected. It concentrates in the parts of the brain where there's mental activity, and then we can detect the emission of positron radiation. So this allows brain scans to give us gorgeous photographs of the thinking brain made possible by antimatter. While antimatter has helped to unlock the secrets of the human brain, the human brain has yet to unlock all the secrets of antimatter. We do not know why the universe is made of matter now, but we are making progress towards answering that question, you know, little steps at a time. Like many mysteries in our ever-changing universe, the truth about antimatter may remain for now in the realm of the unexplained. Mars and mystery have always gone hand in hand. But the most intriguing mystery of the red planet has nothing to do with alien invaders. Scientific evidence suggests that Mars was once a more Earth-like planet with one of the key elements to support life. Water. Water existed in abundance on Mars. We find the evidence of old flows. We see a little tiny bit of water vapor in the atmosphere. There are even features on Mars that look like old river valleys and floodplains. It was once a tropical planet with oceans and seas, but all that water disappeared. How could all the water on Mars have simply vanished? And why did it disappear? These are mysteries that scientists are struggling to solve. Geologic evidence gathered by the Mars rovers and orbiters suggest that 3.5 billion years ago, Mars' watery surface changed dramatically. The once temperate planet became a cold, dry place, and the water vanished. But figuring out when the water disappeared doesn't tell you where it went or why. The water on Mars was lost a very, very, very long time ago. And I'm talking billions of years. And the clues that 
would lead you to know where that water went are long gone. A series of events on Mars appears to have drastically changed the watery landscape. Mars endured an intense period of volcanism that spewed lava across the surface. When it finally ended, the planet's molten iron core solidified. This may have been what caused Mars to lose its magnetic field and protective ozone layer. This left the atmosphere vulnerable to the solar wind from our sun, which is quite powerful. Solar winds pummeled the planet for millions of years, stripping any remaining atmosphere. Now, water vapor that once fell as snow or rain escaped the planet's small gravitational field. The water is brought up into the atmosphere as water vapor, and it's bombarded by ultraviolet radiation, which can split water, which is H2O, into hydrogen and oxygen. And the hydrogen, being the lightest gas known, floats up to the top of the atmosphere and can get swept away by the, uh, the solar winds. Another theory for the loss of Mars water involves a threat from outside the planet. There's evidence that in the early years of the solar system, Mars resided in a deadly flight path. There's one cluster about 3.9 billion years ago called the Great Bombardment that really must have peppered that planet with many, many impacts. And that kind of an event would have actually thrown material and atmosphere right off of the planet and outside of the gravitational uh, field. Let's imagine that we have an asteroid here. And this asteroid is really the size of a mountain. And imagine this is tumbling through space at very high speed. And we're talking tens of thousands of miles per hour. If we come zipping in at high speed, splat. It's lost to space. Much of it will sink in. Some will become atmospheric gases sputtered away to space. Some will be lost. Other answers to the mystery of Mars disappearing water may be hidden deep inside the red planet. Some of the water combined with carbon dioxide to form polar ice caps up to two miles deep and a permafrost that covers much of the surface. But there's evidence that beneath the ice, liquid water still flows. Much of the water on Mars has gone underground, and some of it certainly has migrated down to a depth where it's warm enough for it to exist as liquid water. And then when it gets colder, it's going to be frozen into a cryosphere, if you like, an ice part of the uh, subsurface. And then near the surface, is going to dry out as the water can move through the soil and go into the atmosphere. University of Arizona scientist Peter Smith is eager to solve the mystery of Mars disappearing water. OK, I'm digging a little trench here to show you what happens if you get below the absolute hyper-arid surface and go down just a foot or so, because this is similar to what we're going to be doing on Mars. Smith is the principal investigator for NASA's Phoenix Mars mission. It's a robotic probe with one simple objective, land on Mars and follow the water. What happened to that water? Could have frozen into underground ice or even aquifers of liquid water. These are something we're looking for today using radio and radar to penetrate through the surface and try and locate these uh, reservoirs of water. Smith believes that Arizona's Wilcox Playa reflects what scientists will find when Phoenix finally scratches the red Martian surface. 
even though the surface is parched and salty and dry, just within six inches of the surface is a very wet clay, like a reservoir of water. And there's a whole ecosystem of life that's living in these wet soils and these clays. When it rains, it comes to the surface. And in fact, you see little pools where actually brine shrimp that are locked into these soils. We wonder if we get down under the surface in the right place on Mars, and that is the permafrost region, can we find the same sort of ecosystem around the ice melting over time as climate changes that's habitable for some sort of uh, Martian life forms? Some believe that life on Earth originated on Mars and that its strange transformation foretells our destiny. If that's true, finding Mars water may lead us back to our cosmic beginnings and into the future. When it comes to the universe, what we know is surpassed only by what we have yet to learn. And of all the unexplained mysteries, one remains the greatest of all. Did anything come before the Big Bang? Or was that event truly the beginning of everything? And if it was, what was the spark that lit it? This is the greatest mystery in all of science. What started creation itself? Big Bang Theory has this tremendous hole in it. We are clueless. We are clueless as to what set the Big Bang into motion. The Big Bang is the cosmological model for the birth of our universe. 13.7 billion years ago. Everything in our universe can be traced back to that moment. There seems to be this mysterious point at the beginning, and we call that the singularity. But it, even though it's mysterious and has um, many open questions associated with it, it still makes a good starting point for our timeline. But our scientific instruments are blind and deaf to the period before the Big Bang, if such a period existed at all. The singularity is like a horizon that we can never see beyond. Because in the creation, time was created along with space and along with matter. And the Big Bang is just that sort of event. And therefore, it's impossible to know what happened before the creation event. Nevertheless, scientific speculation as to what happened before the Big Bang is something that intrigues the greatest minds in astrophysics. Some theorists believe that our universe experiences Big Bangs at regular intervals. This cyclic model proposes that every trillion years there's a Big Bang, after which the universe expands before again collapsing, setting the stage for another Big Bang. There's interesting ways that can connect with the story of a previous universe. The end of one universe can bring the beginning of another. Maybe there never was a start, that it, it's somehow been ongoing from an earlier moment and, and never had a uh, creator in the, at all. But we might be closer to an explanation of the pre-Big Bang than we know. The cosmic reverberations from the Big Bang that still echo through the universe may actually hold the answer to the moment before the singularity. 
turns out these standing waves are key to how we understand the universe today. Inflation gives the universe one big hit at the beginning, just like I'm hitting the pot right here. It forms a standing waves, and we can look for those symmetrical patterns in the cosmic radiation today. So we send our satellites out, we observe the radiation, the symmetrical standing waves. A new wave of detectors, gravity wave detectors, will be launched into outer space in the next decade. Connected by laser beams, any shock wave from the instant of creation will jiggle these laser beams and will be able to then record the vibrations left over from the Big Bang itself. That's why I'm confident that we'll be able to probe not just the Big Bang itself, but even the pre-Big Bang era in the coming decades. The lasers will also detect sources of inflationary energy and perhaps determine the mechanism that created the Big Bang. If we struggle to solve the greatest mystery of all, how can we ever hope to really understand the universe? Whenever you get an answer to a question, it almost always leads to more questions. You make progress, and mysteries can get solved, but then there'll always be more mysteries. We are the result of the universe attempting to understand itself. That's my conception of our place in the universe. And so that makes it difficult to understand, but nevertheless, it might be possible. The universe is constantly changing, but the laws the laws of physics are immutable. They don't change. And that gives us hope that out of all this chaos, we'll be able to explain how it all got here to begin with. In our ever-changing universe, the unexplained mysteries will continue to elude us. But we're edging ever closer to unlocking the ultimate secrets, the keys to our past, and the pathways to our future. While science has made sense of many things, there is still plenty left to be discovered about our vast, dark, and mysterious universe.